Welcome everyone. Um, we thank you for being with the Africa Faith and Justice Network for this timely event, Hustlers versus Dynasty, the elections in Kenya and Nigeria and their implications for Africa. I am Lydia Andrews, the Communications and Operations Manager for the Africa Faith and Justice Network, the host of this event. AFJN is a faith-based, nonpartisan coalition of 28 US-based religious communities of men and women. AFJN is the only faith-based, pan-African, issue-driven advocacy group in Washington, DC. Inspired by the gospel and informed by Catholic social teaching, AFJN seeks to educate and advocate for just relations with Africa and to work in partnership with African people as they engage in the struggle for justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. Dr. Stephen Nabu Rogers, the Executive Director of the African Faith and Justice Network, is today's moderator. Dr. Rogers has a background in public policy and urban planning with a special interest in globalization and governance in Africa. He has served in the public and private sectors as an academic researcher and thought leader and has several years of experience in higher education in Sierra Leone, the United States, and South Africa. Prior to joining AFJN, he was an old mutual emerging markets fellow and lecturer at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business where he taught courses on emerging markets, international trade and globalization. Dr. Rogers has a PhD in urban planning and public policy from the University of Texas at Arlington and a master's in social and public policy from Duquesne University. Welcome, Dr. Rogers. Thank you so much, Lydia, for that wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my honor to welcome you uh, to African Faith and Justice Network and to welcome you to our, our events. Um, that we focus on issues that are relevant to, on the, to the continent, especially to the people of Africa and how they are also um, important to people here around, around the world. So I am, I am very honored to welcome today three very distinguished um, experts on the continent, people who have had vast experience academically and who have also worked on the continent and dealt with issues around political economy. Um, they come from different range, different, different, different backgrounds academically, but they are also very much interspersed. But more importantly, they work on the continent. They've worked, they, they, most of the academic work as well as their practical life experiences are really lived experience. These are people who are very passionate about the continent and that's very much demonstrated in their work and as well as in their, in their resumes and their activities. Today's, today's discussion is gonna focus on, on two major players on the continent. Kenya and Nigeria. Now, this is not by accident. Part of the reason is because these are two major African, African um, players when it comes to political economy in terms of what happened in these countries to a large extent has impact on the continent as a whole. So I am going to invite our guests today to briefly provide their perspectives on these issues. Now, let me first introduce the topic. The title of the topic which Lydia has so well um, introduced is Hustlers. Hustlers and versus dynasty, the elections in Kenya, and how they imp how they how they have impact on Africa. Now, the background for you who have read it, it says Kenya's Vice President um, President William Ruto, who actually was um, inaugurated today, actually campaigned on the title of being a hustler, fighting the dynasty, which basically implies people who have actually either been in politics for long or they are actually strongly connected to the major political parties. He actually defeated um, his opponent Raila Odinga during the August election and was inaugurated today um, officially as the president of, of Kenya. He was endorsed by the current, he was not endorsed by the current president, but actually he, his opponent, uh, um, um, Mr. Odinga, who was the, uh, the head of the opposition, was endorsed by the president, which is not normally the kind of stories you would hear in Africa. But both men, Mr. Odinga and Mr. Kenyatta, the outgoing president, they hail from Kenya's, what they call richly extreme legacy families. And this is what has come to be known as dynasty. So they joined forces, but of course the, the, the plan backfired. This was a huge upset. Now, Nigeria is going to have elections in the next coming, coming months, actually in February 2023. It is Africa's most populous country. And sometimes we say as Nigeria goes, so does most of Africa, or if possible, the rest of Africa does. The presidential candidates are working now on their elections, but the depth of the country's economic and security crisis in Nigeria is actually forcing voters to start rethinking their choices. Now, this much to the benefit of Mr. Peter Obi, who is now considered the third candidate. 
a third party candidate. The relatively young geeky former governor of Anambra State, he has generated such a substantial buzz, particularly among young people, both in Nigeria as well as in the diaspora. And they are partly also engaged in funding and financing his campaign against the two main political parties that are headed by what they call septuagenarian candidates, because and they also have very deep pockets. They are very old. I mean, they are older people, but also with very deep pockets and highly established. Now, these political trends in Kenya and Nigeria, there are two case studies, actually from two Africa, two of Africa's political powerhouses. They also they show that Africa's youth are increasingly fed up with the political systems that have been very dominant. They see these, these systems as marred by endemic as well as endemic corruption, where politicians often make promises, but they fail to deliver on these promises. But the questions that we have here at African Faith and Justice Network, as we look at the, these political dynamics, but more often as we look at development on the continent and see where the young people are engaged, is whether, in fact, these are changes on the outside. In actual fact, they are organic changes. Are these really hustlers, which is actually a narrative for someone who actually doesn't belong to these dynasties, or are they just new iterations of the existing dynasty? The question is, will Mr. Ruto actually deliver on the promises that he made when he was running for office? In other words, representing the, the men on the street. Does, does Mr. Obi even have a chance at all in actually winning the election? So these are these elections, are they even bad weather? In other words, are they elections that we should see as what is to come in other countries in Africa? Now, I want to say just um, to be mindful that in 2023, there are going to be a lot of elections on the continent. And these are so important. There are about 12 elections, Chad, DRC, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Liberia, Madagascar, Nigeria, my own country of birth, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, and the rest, as well as Zimbabwe. So these are our elections coming. What do these elections mean? Today, we have these experts who will kind of briefly talk about them. And it is my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Professor Mil Soko, to briefly open up this really interesting conversation. Professor Soko, I have known him. He was actually, the, he was my director at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town while I was there um, between 2012 and 2017 when I left. Professor Soko is a well-renowned and is highly, highly sought after in South Africa and most part of the, of the continent. He's the author of one of his famous book I call South Africa and the World. And he is a professor of international <clears throat> business and strategy at Vitz Business School and the former director of the University of Cape Town Graduate School of Business. He is an ardent writer on local and global issues. He holds a master's in international studies from the University of Stellenbosch, a very highly regarded university in South Africa, as well as a master's and doctorate in international political economy from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. It is my pleasure, it is my honor to introduce, to welcome you, Professor Soko, so that you can take the floor and give us briefly 10 minutes, your own perspective on the topic. Thank you. All right, all right. Uh, thank you Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Rogers. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to, to reconnect you with you after so, so many years. And I'm really, really glad to see that you're doing uh, this wonderful, exciting work. Uh, this is an important topic. Uh, so uh, what I'm gonna do here is to distill it into, into five themes. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw your, your, um, your message about us making a, 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 a 10 minute um, presentation uh, and, and I will do that. And I, I think that there are five things I want to say. One is that, of course, what is happening or what has happened in, uh, in Kenya is significant, is extremely significant, uh, but it's not confined to Kenya. You know, you're, you're talking about East Africa. Uh, we've just been witnessed an election in, a, in, a, in, in a Angola, which was a very closely contested election. The, the, the governing party there has been uh, uh, holding sway for many, many years, but it got a, a big shock. Uh, they won the election by, by 51%, with a very, very dominant political party uh, run by uh, the late Eduardo Dos Santos, President Eduardo Dos Santos, which won elections easily in, a, in, the, in, the, in the past, but they got a big shock. We also saw a, a really, really big shock in Zambia. Zambia is an outlier. 
in Africa. When you talk about Zambia, this is one country, it's an outlier, which is now governed by somebody has got nothing to do with the history of the liberation movement or the independence movement, and uh, who was um, voted into power by a very restive youth, uh, and mainly restive youth, and were, were, were very um, disillusioned with the, with the status quo. So uh, what is happening in Kenya and it, what might, I, I, and I'll leave it to my colleague from, from Nigeria to talk more about Nigeria, because it's still very early to say what will happen there. But, what has happened in Kenya is significant, but we should not get overexcited. This is the first message I want. We should not get overexcited about what's going on there and what's going on in Ghana, what's going on in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in Zambia, in, 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 in Angola, et cetera. The second point I want to, the broad theme that I want to highlight is that we are seeing the, in, and, and you've alluded to this, uh, Dr. Rogers, you know, we are a young continent in terms of age and demographic profile, and we're seeing young people asserting themselves on this continent. Uh, when we look at the election results in Zambia, young people were very instrumental in unseating the regime of Edgar Lungu, the, the previous president. And when you look at uh, Kenya, young people were central also in unseating, and, and the, this will happen in many other countries. And it, will happen, it, it, it happened in South Africa in the local government elections in 2016, and it might happen uh, in, uh, in 2024 when South Africa holds its next election. So we're having a restive, unhappy, uh, unsettled young people who want change. They're crying out for change, right? They're crying out for change. So that's the first, the, th the second uh, broad theme I wanted to, to highlight. But I think the, the, the third one is that uh, we, we need to, as in Africa, we need to focus more on leadership in its broad sense, not just leadership, but also governance in its broad sense. The, I, I would like this conversation to focus not just on personalities like William Ruto, like uh, Lorenzo you know, in, uh, in Angola, like uh, Peter Obi, you know, because we've had that problem for many years where you have individuals who project themselves as messiahs who can solve problems. But in the absence of proper leadership and governance, and when I want to talk about governance, I'm talking about institutions, processes, and all those things which Africa lacks, uh, we are not going to achieve any, any progress. And then the, the, the fourth point I want to highlight is that, uh, you know, there is a huge need for, for um, African countries to prepare the next generation of leaders that are going to manage the transition that is happening on the African continent. I'm a very, um, very uh, interested uh, follower of what happens and observe what happens in East Asia and I've done a lot of work on how East Asian countries, including China and Singapore and Japan and other countries have done very well in terms of preparing uh, new layers of leaders to take on their responsibilities, critical leadership responsibilities of managing change. Africa is going through a transition. It's going through enormous changes, demographic changes, political changes, uh, changes in terms of regional integration, changes. So it needs a caliber of leaders who can manage that. The Chinese did that very well. You know, in 1976, when Mao Zedong died, uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power and he decided he was going to change the course of the direction that the country was taking. He was going to embrace capitalism, but capitalism on Chinese terms. Right, we call it socialism with Chinese characteristics, and uh, he saw his responsibility as bringing China into the global economy, and but on Chinese terms, and he, he performed that responsibility, and then he handed over to a new generation of leaders, uh, you know, like Hu Jintao uh, and then um, uh, Jiang Zemin and all those people, and the current leader now is. Xi Jinping. So each generation of leaders has had historical obligations to perform, 
to, to, to take the, the, the country forward. Uh, so when you look at, they, they, they sell for five years, 10 years, and, and they head over to a new generation. The question is, do we have that in Africa? Do we have succession planning in Africa to manage all these seismic changes that are taking place on the African continent? So that's the, the fourth point. The, the fifth point is, the fifth point is, you know, I would like us to focus on how we as a continent can develop a growth path and a development path that doesn't seek to mimic what is happening in Asia or in North America or in Europe, but which is uniquely African. So if I can say a few comments, uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, based on these things, you know, when I look at William Ruto in Kenya, I'm a very, I've got a, a very good relationship with Kenya and, uh, and I, I really, really do a lot of work there. I've got good friends, I've got people who are in leadership there uh, and including some of the senior leaders there. And I think, as I said, it's a significant development with a William Ruto. But the question I want to ask is, is William Ruto an outsider or an insider, right? So there's a, he, 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 you know, he was very close to, uh, to, to Uhuru Kenya. They were very close, they were big buddies and they fell out. But he was a very clever politician that reminded me of Jacob Zuma in South Africa. He repositioned himself, right? He thought, okay, is part of is a very wealthy man. They are very wealthy. The Odinga, the political dynasties, they are very wealthy. The Odingas, the with the Kenyatas, they're extremely wealthy, right? And who, uh, uh, Ruto is very wealthy too. As part of the, he was part of a club, all right. But they fell out, and he was very smart. Uh, you know, he somersaulted back by appealing directly to the masses, and that was his original constituency. Okay, so he's a man of means. Uh, and they decided to come up with this bottom-up economic model. And, uh, you know, he, he really, really outlasted the political dynasties. And I give him, I give him credit for that. He outlasted Kenyatta, he outlasted uh, Odina. The, I, I give him credit for that. But the big question is, does he have the staying power to do what he has promised the um, the the Kenyan electorate, you know, uh, he, you know, is is promised to overhaul the social, economic, and political edifice. Uh, he wants to, wants to deal with poverty, inequality, and all those things. That is a big, big question mark, right? The same can be said about, and and uh, as I said, I'm not going to speak much about Peter Obi, but but from what I know, is a very wealthy man um, who is also uh, positioning himself as an outsider. We had in South Africa, Jacob Zuma, who was part of the establishment, was part of the establishment, but he positioned himself as an outsider. And he won the election and he presided over the most disastrous administration this country has ever had in the post-apartheid era. So uh, I'll give the, uh, the young people in Nigeria, the point is this, you young people are crying out for leadership, right? They're crying out for leadership. They want change, whether it's in, in, in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, they're crying out for leadership. So it's easy for them to fall vulnerable to leaders who position themselves as messiahs. So I'll give Peter Obi the benefit of doubt, but I would like to hear what my colleague is. The question is, will he be a savior? You know, it's, I, I know there are certain things that he can do to bring the Southeast uh, region of Nigeria into the broad political, mainstream political process and do other things and so on. But is that the solution? Because I'll talk about the solution later when we, we discuss, you know, uh, the same can be said about Hakaine Hichilema in, in Zambia. Hakaine Hichilema, you know, he, he's contested elections many times, he lost, but he won, he won the, the last one because he was very smart enough to take advantage of the, uh, the, the weaknesses of his uh, the incumbent, Edgar Lungu. Right? So uh, uh, the Zambians were had enough of the previous regime because there had been a decline of democracy in Zambia under Lungu and in a way, you know, a terrible uh, human rights abuses and all those things. 
levels of corruption had risen uh, extensively, and, and the Zambians were faced with, with unbearable uh, cost of living because of the debt crisis the country that was faced with. And again, again, it was the young people in Zambia who unseated the majority of the votes. I, I'm, I'm going back to the theme. You sit in Nigeria, you sit in Kenya. So, so young people are leading the charge in terms of unseating these, these governments. But the big challenge that uh, Hichilema has, and he's no, he knows that I met him and I've discussed with him, uh, he knows that, that if he can't fix the economy, if he can't fix the economy in Zambia, is in deep trouble. William Ruto knows very well, if he can't fix the economy in the Kenya, he's in trouble. And Peter Obi, if he wins the election, I don't know uh, what his chances are, but if he can't fix it, he's in trouble. Uh, Joel Lorenzo in, in Angola, he, he removed Eduardo dos Santos, his predecessor who presided over the Angolan political system for many, many decades. And he promised that he was going to change the economy, he was going to reform the economy. And he made some very good, good, good initial steps. But, you know, he, he because of the stagnation that ensued subsequently, he nearly lost the election that was held uh, recently. So my, my, I'll talk more about this later, but what I want to say is my opening remarks, Dr. Rogers, is that these are very interesting, fascinating uh, developments on the African continent, but they are not substantive, right? They're not substantive uh, in terms of addressing the underlying problems that this continent faces. These are nice cosmetic changes that we're seeing, but we need to ask the question, are these people uh, different from the establishment or they position themselves differently from the establishment? Uh, are they responsive to the needs of the young people, of the poor? We will see how that goes. I'll talk later about what we need to do, You know, in, what I believe we need to do as a continent to address the underlying problems that we face. And I'll focus broadly on the issue of leadership and governance in a broad sense, not in, the, in terms of personalities. I don't know if I've, I've, have I used all my time? Or you want me to say more? Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Kwame. I was trying to find the mute button. I was having yeah. so much fun and enjoying this analysis that I wasn't even sure you had gone a little bit of work, but that's how, you know, you, I mean, that's how rich the material was. So <laughs> it's so hard to keep up to 10 minutes and I really apologize. But I think yeah. you really made some very good points, you know, and I, I you know, I, you and I come a long way and I've always listened to you and I see your broader perspective on all of these issues. And I think you, you seem to come from this position saying there is an opportunity here and the hunger for young people to actually get engaged and bring this organic change. But then the question you ask is whether these changes are organic. And you know, Africa, um, and I think one of the questions I might want to ask you before I actually transition to my next speaker who will actually I mean, go even you know much more deeper into some of these is, you know, there's this thing about isomorphic mimicry. And I always say, you know, um, this, this idea that somehow Africa, you know, we make, you know, our ability, you know, our sometimes our tendency to mimic changes in the West without actually having this similar results. So, you know. So you see that all the time, we change public policies, but they don't have any meaning, you know, and then there is this thing about people focusing on narratives a lot, as opposed to tangible changes. So yeah, Ruto, basically what you're saying was this is more, this hostile narrative was just a powerful narrative to get you into office, as opposed to the reality, whether you are- Just a minute, Dr. Rogers, my, my internet connection is not terribly stable. Okay. Uh, so I, I may lose you at some point, I, I, I think we, Maybe we can do the presentations and questions are then asked. Okay, that so I was going to actually come into you. So do you want to? Do you want me to introduce you now so that you can talk? So that yeah, we, I think yeah. that would probably be. Preferable. I really appreciate that. I was going to actually because I know you are you are way in Sierra Leone, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So um, I, we I am going to introduce um, Dr. Um, Ambassador Lance Nagberry to you, and um, Ambassador Berry is from Sierra Leone, my home country, and he's a very highly respected uh, diplomat, academic. But let me just briefly read his profile. And His Excellency, Dr. Lance Nightberry, is the ambassador of Sierra Leone to Switzerland and the permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations, including the WTO in Geneva. Dr. Berry, he has served 
as the president of the Arms Treaty, Trade and Treaty ATT from August 2020 to 2021. Prior to that, his appointment in Geneva, he was appointed to Geneva by His Excellency, our president of Sierra Leone, Dr. Julius Mada Bio in 2018, where he currently serves. Dr. Berry has worked for the United Nations for many years, including as a coordinator and finance expert of the United Nations Security and Council Panels of Experts on Liberia, following his appointment by the UN Secretary General um, Ban Ki Moon in 2012. Prior to that, Dr. Berry, he acted in numerous other positions, including as a senior researcher and political analyst for security and peacekeeping matters in New York, Addis Ababa, and Ghana. He was also head of the Liberian Country Office and West African Program, and he was a senior researcher for the International Diamond Trade and Human Security Project of Partnership Africa Canada, which we call PACNET in Ottawa, in, uh, among others, for their work to end the trade in conflict diamonds that led to the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme, which was about blood diamonds, for many of you may have heard about that. Dr. Berry and two of his colleagues were actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by the American Senator Patrick Lehi and Congressman Tony P. Hall and Frank Wolf in 2002. He's an academic and he's a writer. Dr. He holds a PhD in history from Amsterdam and an MA from Wilfred Laurel University in Canada in international relations and military history. He has published extensively and he was awarded the Outstanding Research Award by the Canadian government in 2002. He, um, so it is really my honor truly to, um, and to welcome Dr. Berry and then to provide your perspective. Welcome His Excellency, go ahead, you have 10 minutes. I know I shouldn't be saying that for my ambassador, but unfortunately- no, Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Rogers, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I'm slightly less sanguine about the um, elections of William Ruto. And he, he spoke of himself as a hustler, but he has been part of the establishment for a long time. He was home, uh, Minister of Home Affairs uh, on the, um, Moai Kibaki. And uh, so, so he, is, he is not an outsider. Uh, the really interesting and important paradigm shifting election will be if um, Peter Obi wins in Nigeria, which is a big if. I'm not sure it will happen. Uh, I think, but 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 uh, as you began, Professor Soko, um, uh, th these two countries are, are extremely critical in Africa, and and um, certainly Kenya in East Africa is is um, the nodal point for uh, economic development, for security assurance, and for a host of other issues. Uh, it is of great strategic importance. So is Nigeria in West Africa. And, and, and across Africa. So that the elections in Kenya, uh, we are able to resolve without any real hiccup. The constitutional process was allowed to run through. Um, the elections were challenged and um, it went to the Supreme Court, which is uh, certainly part of the uh, constitutional process. And the Supreme Court um, gave a verdict in favor uh, of the winning candidate. And that, I think that's very significant. It has helped to embed democracy further in, I mean, it's not the first time this has happened. Um, the second time seems to be really de decisive. And I think that, in a sense, it's paradigm shifting. Uh, it shows um, that the Kenyan electoral system is getting more and more uh, sophisticated. That's a good thing for all of Africa. Um, well, what will um, what is the potential of Mr. Rutu uh, to to be transformative? Uh, on that question, I'm not. I think reasonable people will disagree. Um, uh, he he ha has in uh, throughout. He was vice president. Now uh, that his election has up for some um to to many people. I mean, he's himself not a young man. He's in his 60s, and he's not an outsider. I mean, it's, it comes from the Kalenji ethnic group, uh, which produce, uh, uh, which has produced a president or two uh, for, for Kenya. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many succession may, makes a dynasty. Uh, so I wouldn't say Uru Kenyatta. Um, well, the Kenyatta family is a dynasty. It's, a extreme, it's an extremely prominent, influential, and very wealthy uh, family. Uh, or the Odinga family has never produced a president. So I mean, the question um, 
of, of a, a hustler against dynasty was, I think, a very creative um, uh, simplification, which, which uh, appealed to people. Um, so, yes, um, that, that's the Kenyan election. I think the more interesting prospect is offered by Peter Obi. Uh, he is clearly an outsider. I mean, um, no Igbo um, has won an election in Nigeria to become president. He's Igbo. Um, he himself is not that young as well. He's probably at the same age as William Ruto in the 60s. But the other candidates uh, are much older. I mean, Nigeria has this arrangement which came uh, in, in, to, to after the death of Abacha also, the, the new constitutional arrangement, uh, to say uh, that there has to be a balancing act between the, uh, the three key regions and ethnic groups, so that there has to be a federal character in terms of succession. Uh, no Igbo has benefited. Igbo, the Igbos are one of the largest ethnic groups, extremely enterprising. But the elections have been, presidency has since been dominated by uh, people from the North and the Yoruba. Uh, so if an Igbo is able to make a breakthrough, this will be very significant, especially as it seems to enjoy very broad support. I mean, I just looked at the um, the, the electoral, the, the vo vo voter registration figure, some of it. Uh, it seems that young people are registering in droves. Um, I mean, Nigeria, is, all of Africa, is already a very youthful population. But many young people are, are registering with great enthusiasm. And more, many of them are singing the praises of Obi. Uh, that may that may signal something. Um, but what we do know, going by previous elections, I was in Nigeria uh, for the elections that brought Buhari to power. Um, I mean, candidates, presidential candidates, and I've observed other, other elections in Africa, presidential candidates that, that tend to attract mainly young people and mainly people in the diaspora never win. Because the problem has been that young people don't even register to vote, uh, let alone vote. Um, on the day of the vote, they will all be, uh, I mean, that's a cliche that they will all be drunk and sleeping and, and, and will not bother to go to vote. But I think this may be actually quite different because the figures uh, tell me that there is something there. There is um, uh, a level of movement. Uh, whether he can break through against the Tinobus and the um, uh, uh, Muhammad, what's his name, the, the former vice president of Bansaju, who uh, these are extremely wealthy people, they are billionaires. Obi is a millionaire, he's not, he's not nearly as rich as these folks. And, and they come from entrenched ethnic groups, uh, large ones. Uh, so they have that, that ethnic regional base of support. Uh, but if he's able to break through and win, uh, there will be violence, but uh, Nigeria always stabilizes itself. Um, and, and that will be a hugely significant uh, uh, change. It may, it may make a real paradigm shift. Um, it will impact on elections in other parts of, uh, at, the very, at the very least, West Africa. And there are so many, as my, my good brother Stephen uh, mentioned, there are so many elections next year in, in, in the continent, uh, in our region, in, in West Africa, in other places. Uh, but but the, the elegant outcome of the Kenyan election, and hopefully the one that will happen in Nigeria in February, um, the, the Angolan one, there was a lot of anxiety uh, that this might uh, go, go septic, it might go bad. But it, it, it was also pulled through uh, in a way, although it's not maybe a, a terribly good outcome for many people, but um, a stable outcome nonetheless. And that's really, really very important. Um, do we, are we uh, elect uh, uh, the good, the, the really good folks? Uh, imagine out of these, we, the winners is um, well, Ruto will have will, will have been the, the first choice for anybody interested in good governance in 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 transformative leadership. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily. But there was objection for of the uh, manoeuvre between the President of Uru Kenyatta made, um, uh, endorsing another candidate other than his vice president, uh, that didn't look extremely tidy. And, and, and um, 
and he had served out two terms. And if you have served out two terms, it's very difficult to, to remain popular anywhere in the world. And, and so if you choose a successor who is not part of it, he carries that body. And that, you know, was a problem with Odinga. He might well have won if he had not embraced um, the support of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. But that's where we are. So um, I would like to thank my, my good friend, uh, Dr. Rogers and Professor Soko for the extremely insightful comments, which ranges across most of Africa. Mine is more uh, practical perspective uh, based upon what I've observed and, 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 uh, and, and read and, and seen and deal with uh, almost uh, daily. Um, so I'll end my presentation there. If there are any questions, um, we'll be, um, I'll, be, I'll be keen to, to hear them. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rogers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Lassina Berry. And um, it, that was such a very insightful um, um, contribution. And I like the whole idea of um, a paradigm shift. You know, young people um, becoming a little more um, excited about getting engaged and then um, kind of looking for change in their various countries. And I think um, somehow the idea is whether that change itself is organic or whether it's been hijacked by the system, which actually kind of manifests itself in a particularly new iteration. Now, looking forward to the future, um, one way perhaps we can, you know, just um, move on is to actually let um, um, our, another, our experts in Nigeria itself, where the election is about to come up, uh, who can give us a much more um, detailed <clears throat> perspective about um, the future in Nigeria in terms of what, I mean, what is happening. I, I'm, I'm so delighted to, to, to introduce to you our next panel, um, and Dr. Austin Tam George. Now, Dr. George is a Nigerian, so he's based in Nigeria, and that is really, really important as well. He's a communication and public policy uh, consultant with a PhD from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Um, he also attended the IESC Business School in Barcelona, Spain, where he studied communication and leadership. And um, Tambayo's extensive sector, multi-sectoral experience travels the fields of education, government, oil, and gas, and nonprofit. Um, Dr. Tam George has taught in different universities, including the University of Cape Town, South Africa, where he was an Andrew M. Mellon Postdoctoral Research Fellow. He is the Executive Director now of the Institute of Communication and Corporate Studies in Lagos, Nigeria. So it is my honor, and um, I am very, very excited to welcome Dr. George to, um, to, to take up the podium from there. Welcome. And by the way, if you have questions, we will allow the questions to come in once the speakers have made their introductory, their introductory comments. And then, so please keep on sending the questions. Thank you, Dr. Bayo. Bayo. I think he was, he was still on. I hope he's still. Yes, um, Dr. Stevie, thank you. And um, uh, thanks a lot to, my, to the previous speakers. Uh, they really laid very solid foundation for this conversation to go forward. Um, they've mentioned already in, uh, you know, uh, in their discussions that these two politicians, William, William Ruto, who is now the president, and uh, Mr. Peter B, who is now, who appears to be launching an insurgent uh, candidacy in, in Nigeria, you know, they are not, you know, strictly speaking, outsiders in the political systems um, of both countries. Uh, Ruto, as we know, has been in the system for a long time, until recently when he was VP. Uh, the vice president. Um, OB has perhaps a, 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 a different tra political trajectory. Um, he was uh, once um, governor of uh, this native Anambra state, where by all accounts, he, he left a very impressive record. For instance, uh, you know, by the time he became governor, uh, the Anambra state was uh, 26 in the, in the West African examination chart. Uh, but by the time he left, a number of states became number one um, on that chart. So he's put very strong, disproportionate attention on education. Um, and he's promising now in his campaign to repeat this on a national, uh, on a national scale. As, you, as some of the, 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 uh, the um, you know, guests here might, might, might know, like they, the tertiary education system in Nigeria has been grounded for about five or seven months now. Um, and the fact that we are talking about a candidate um, who has a very passionate interest in education, 
who has a track record in turning education around to a true policy reform in his, in his native Anambra, uh, now saying publicly during, during um, his media rounds that he's going to replicate and improve upon this um, in Nigeria. Th this message has very powerful re resonance you know, with young people. Uh, as you probably know, Nigeria has over 20 million people out of school, uh, children out of school now, according to the latest figures uh, coming from UNESCO. 20 million children out of school. Just five years ago or, or so, there were just 13 million children out of school. So you can see that on a sector by sector basis, Nigeria is having a really tough time. Um, economically, there is also a very strong, a very strong um, tilt yeah, downwards because um, President Jonathan in 2015 handed over one of the best economies in Africa. In fact, a Nigerian economy was considered to be the largest in Africa in 2015. As we speak now, in 2022, you know, Nigeria has suffered the second recession. The, the economy appears to, be, appears to be collapsing on all fronts. Uh, the Naira dollar exchange rate um, is now over 700 Naira to $1, unprecedented in the history of financial management in this country. So we are dealing with a very serious uh, crisis almost in every sector. I suspect most of you already know that the security crisis in Nigeria now as it is, is unprecedented. And not only the security crisis as, uh, by itself, there, have, there appears to be an almost total abdication of leadership by the current administration. And this has led to very serious disaffection among the population. And I suspect that, you know, what Peter B has done has been so far, you know, to tap into this, 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 this disenchantment across the country and to say that, look, I'm going to completely rethink the, the, nature, of, the nature of governance in this country. Um, I'm going to make sure that I bring in as many young people as possible because this country actually belongs to the future. I'm going to work like never before uh, with Nigerians who are scattered all over the diaspora to make sure that we have a very large pool of expertise uh, and form a government of national unity. I mean, for a country that has problems with tribalism, bigotry, um, and, and those kind of things, Obi appears to be creating a narrative of unity uh, of purpose uh, in a way that has very powerful resonance uh, for young people. And so, when the young people and you know a lot of people who are in the independent uh, block listen to, uh, to to be they feel that perhaps this is an alternative uh, that we can all line up behind. You know there is also the problem of anti-corruption. Incidentally, the current administration in Nigeria, uh, headed by uh, President Buhari, came into office in, 2000, in 2015, promising to wage um, a very strong anti-corruption campaign. Six months now to, to leave office after, after, after almost eight years, uh, there is a strong perception that, that corruption has in fact worsened and now than it was uh, seven years ago. Uh, there's also the problem of whether the economy can in fact improve. We've seen a situation where, you know, food prices, you know, have completely gone out of control, but for so many young people, a lot of people feel very frustrated. So there's a very powerful disenchantment across the country on a sector by sector basis. And what Peter B has done basically has been to tap into this, this disenchantment and create an alternative narrative of good governance uh, and anti-corruption. So at, the, at, these, at these individuals, William Ruto and the Peter B outsiders, not outsiders in the, in the literal sense of political participation, but outsiders I suspect, um, in the way that they have created an alternative narrative of governance, um, such that look, if you want, if you if you are not happy with this the way the situation is in this country, and uh, we are going to create, you know, a completely different uh, model of governance that brings people together. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, um, President Buhari appears to have created, uh, for the first time, a narrative of nepotism and bigotry elevated these tendencies to the, to the policy, uh, to, the, to the level of state policy. Uh, more and more from the very beginning of his administration, Buhari made it clear that he was going to administer the country according to the voting patterns that he received. 
And he made it very clear in the beginning of the administration that I will not be as fair to people who give me 5% votes as much as I will be to those people, uh, those sections of the country that give me 95% of the votes. Now, if you, if you frame governance according to the percentage of votes that you get in the country that is already racked you know, by tribal and religious cleavages, you know, it, 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 a lot of people feel that Nigeria has never been more divided than it, than, than it has been in the past seven years. And so when Obi you know, comes into the political terrain to create a narrative of unity, a narrative of collectivizing people, bringing people together around the common vision of, of discipline, around common vision of economic uh, prosperity, shared, shared prosperity, around the vision of a meritocracy instead of simply where you come from. This, the, you know, his unique achievement so far, I, I have no way of knowing whether he's going to win the election or not, but his unique achievement so far down the line has been to create a narrative of, of, of togetherness, of efficiency, of meritocracy in a way that will bring people, uh, people together. As we go forward in the conversation, I would like to share some of the things he said, you know, that more and more people feel that perhaps this is the person, not necessarily a messiah, uh, because I understand, you know, we are, uh, Professor Soko was talking, uh, when he was talking about this tendency towards messianism, is this the person who will solve all the problems of the continent, or all the, all the problems um, of the country? In Nigeria, at least, the feeling is not that Obi is necessarily going to be a messiah, but the feeling is that at least he's been able to create a narrative of efficiency, I'm going to tackle, and he's, he's very programmatic in the way he presents these things. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about them in, in abstraction. He provides statistics. You may not, you may not agree you know, with his position, but you have no doubt that Peter B has, you know, has an opinion of what to do on a sector by sector basis to move the country in a different direction. And I think that this is what has resonated with so many young people, uh, you know, this, this ele election cycle. And it will be interesting, uh, uh, Stephen, to see what is going to happen in the next in the next uh, few weeks or so when the official campaign season opens, and then to hear directly from the other candidates? Unfortunately, um, the other candidates have not had a lot to say concerning specific policy proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are seeing, uh, sadly, is a repeat of the kind of divisionism, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, regional thinking. Uh, nobody is talking about how food prices have gone out of out of the window. What they intend to do, we haven't heard directly from those from from those other uh, serious candidates. Perhaps as the official campaign window opens, uh, we'll have a chance to have a, a, a far clearer understanding of what we are stand on a sector by sector basis. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you very very much, Dr. Austin Tam George. You know, you, I love the line, you know, the problem is you don't know whether Peter Obi will win, but the fact is that he presents a narrative that has really kind of, um, um, kind of, um, you know, um, kind of kind of provided a new framework for the elections in Nigeria. The idea that somehow people get gravitated to something that has nothing to do with identity politics, but something to do with actual change or something to do with actual um, um, governance, you know, and you make promises you deliver, economic policies you deliver. It's in itself, a, uh, it's in itself actually a, 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 a win. Should, even in even when the elections are over, and I think I, I think that that was what my overall my overall action my questions were going to be because one of the things I seem to be getting, and I think I see a couple of questions coming from uh, the chat, and I'm going to ask uh, these questions. It's like everyone agrees that somehow that Africa has this very vibrant youthful population. And everyone seems to agree that this youthful population kind of yearns for organic change. But the question I think is this apprehension. And I, I, again, you guys, my panelists are going to correct me here is whether this change that we are seeing is organic, yes. the yearning self would. So I will start by asking, I'm going to go to Professor Sook. The first question came from you. Um, this was from, um, um, I'm looking from um, Taozi Ramirez. She was asking, she said, Excellent points, Prof. Soko. Could you say more on what an Afrocentric growth or development model would look like and how we get there as a continent? And I think that's one of the things when you argued about, look, I don't think the change we are having is really the organic change. Could you just share some light on that, Prof. Soko, for me, please? Thank you. 
you are you're on mute. <laughs> Thank Sorry you. about that, uh, Dr. Rogers. I wouldn't venture into describing it as a as an Afrocentric model because. I've learned the hard way over the years, you know, that uh, labels sometimes don't work. What I would say, you know, I will answer that question by relating a, an anecdote uh, of a, a conversation I had with a senior Chinese bureaucrat in Beijing. I had been invited by the Chinese foreign ministry and I spent two weeks with top leaders in China to learn about how China operates. And I met with a, a director general in the Ministry of Commerce. And I, in my naivety, I asked him, could you please explain to me what, how the Beijing consensus works, right? Because this is what had been written in the academic uh, texts, you know, Washington consensus, privatization, all those things. Uh, and there was a, and, and that was um, compared with the Beijing consensus, which was different you know, uh, state-led development and all those things. But uh, these are concepts that were developed by Western academics, which the Chinese were not familiar with. <laughs> so we have a situation where we have Western academics writing about countries and giving concepts, which the people, the main protagonists are not even aware of. And this guy says to me, Professor Soko, I don't understand what you're talking about. What do you mean Beijing consensus? I tried to explain, and he said to me, no, 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 let me tell you, let me tell you this. We as a Chinese are very pragmatic nation, mm -hmm. right? Very pragmatic. So what you read, for instance, the statements that are issued by our top leadership sometimes may sound revolutionary because that is part of the socialist, socialist rhetoric that we convey to, you know, to mobilize the masses. But when it comes to policy, we are pragmatic. We go around the world, look for what works. We, we study what other countries do. We look for what works and we adopt it. What doesn't work for us, we reject, right? So this is what I say to my president uh, because I can talk to my president and oh, we need to be pragmatic as a country like China. Because China, we think it's a socialist state, it's totally a capitalist state, right? But we must also wean ourselves off the habit of thinking that China, and this is the problem with African leaders. Everybody in Africa, you go everywhere, they're flocking to China. Delegations want to see how the Chinese model works. It's nonsense, right? There's a lot we can learn from China, but there's a lot we can learn from the US. There's a lot we can learn from Switzerland, for instance, in terms of how apprenticeships work, how apprenticeship, even in Austria, in Germany, manufacturing, we need to broaden our perspective and our horizons and learn from all these countries. There are certain things that China does well, fine, but there are certain things that it doesn't do well, we need to reject them. Now, when you look, for instance, the state-owned enterprises, I always say to people here, the leadership in South Africa, you know, you were talking about the reform of state-owned enterprises, and you, President Ramaphosa, you went to China to learn about it. You should have gone directly to Singapore because everything China knows about how you govern state-owned enterprises, they learn from Singapore. So go directly to Singapore, right? That's the first point. Pragmatism is very important because we can't, uh, we can't talk about an Afrocentric development model. You know, Africa is 54 countries. Some are larger than others. Some speaks, you know, there's one that speaks Spanish, which is Equatorial Guinea. Some speak uh, Portuguese. Some, it's a complex continent, right? There are differences, language, and so on. So we've got to be mindful of that. I've just uh, been working on a team for the African Union developing a, a framework on corporate governance for the African continent. Right? We have developed that, we've submitted it, it's with the lawyers and it's going to the AU in Addis Ababa. It's a fantastic document, but the key thing is how do we domesticate it in individual countries because they're different. We can't just say this is, a, this is an African corporate governance framework. No, it's not. It's got to be adapted to each country. That is the next challenge uh, that we face as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a continent. So what am I saying? I'm, I'm saying that we should not assume that this is a homogeneous continent, right? It's different in many ways, the commonalities, and we've got to be sensitive 
uh, to the communities, but also sensitive to the uh, to the diff to the differences. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, um, whoever asked the question, but I I I I, I, um, I don't know. I think I think you 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 sound like you really responded to the question very well, at least from my understanding, and uh, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, maybe my the, the audience will have additional questions to that. But I think you're right, because I think what you're saying is it's not really there's no one particular model. Yeah. And I like it when I had when I just opened the conversation after you spoke before uh, Ambassador Lance and I very came in was look, this idea of isomorphic mimic where we pick stuff or we bring it to our continent, and sometimes yeah. we really do not understand it, and then we don't produce similar results, right? So on the outside, we look like we're doing well. On the inside, we are not, because it's not a model that is properly understood and it's not grounded on our own, you know, on our own realities. So it sounds like, so then you have these different outcomes, you know, and then sometimes we go back and say, what is Afrocentric or where do we go to the other one? And then, so I wanted to ask these questions uh, to Professor, um, to Dr. Tam. And um, Dr. Tam, um, so you you said something and somebody sent a question on Nigeria. And I think it goes back to what Professor Soko just said. He says, we talk about preparing good leaders for Africa. Um, I totally agree. But when we, when will we talk about the preparing the masses to be good followers? masses that commit to advancing good governance. Is there any preparation currently being made in Africa to educate the masses about their duties and responsibilities as good citizens and good followers responsible to advance good governance? And I think that's a very good question because it sounds like there's this apprehension that somehow the change in itself, you know, it's kind of seemed to be hijacked by the people who are running for power. And as Dr. Dr. Uh, Ambassador Berry said, this, these are not really um, hostiles as they present themselves. So, uh, Dr. George, I don't know if you want to just chime in on that. Yes, if th this is a very important question. In fact, I kind of anticipated um, that, the, that the matter was going to arise. Otherwise, I was going to, to pose it to myself anyway. So this is a very important question. And it speaks to the level of social and political consciousness, you know, of the citizens of this, of this continent. Um, you know, there, ten there tends to be an unfortunate tendency to see democracy only as a ritual or simply holding elections every four or five years, uh, depending on the country. But the democracy, of course, is, is much more than that. It involves, uh, you know, keeping vigil at polling units to make sure that the results, you know, reflect the true wishes of the people. And when that is done and the, the, the government is formed, people must not go to sleep. They must hold politicians to account. They must make sure that power remains with the people and, the, and those who um, occupy public office should understand that they exist in office only to serve uh, the people. But you can't expect politicians uh, to hold themselves to account. Um, it, will, it, will, it, it will be like, um, it will be the equivalent of expecting landlords, you know, to hold a meeting to reduce rents. That, that's likely not going to happen. So politicians are not known to hold themselves to account, but people, their citizens who are active Citizens who create all their you know, structures of accountability, citizens who use the law to hold public office holders to, to account, you know, must be alive to their citizenship obligations. You know, unless that is done, I'm afraid that some of these fellows may just get into office and then delink themselves from the people. And then when things go wrong, you know, people begin to complain and say, oh, well, let's wait till another four years when we'll vote them out of office. And, you know, our experience in the, uh, on the continent have shown that we need to be very careful in terms of building consensus around good governance. And that good governance cannot happen by chance. People will have to demand it. They will have to make sacrifices for it. Uh, if you talk about the level of social consciousness, especially in Nigeria, the young people, especially, you know, in the last two years or so, have shown very strong disaffection and um, you know, the, you probably remember the NSAS uh, protest where a lot of young people, you know, you know, lost their lives. And now, I think they have dovetailed into, you know, this campaign by P two B to see whether it is possible for them to create an alternative country for themselves, you know, or an alternative destiny for themselves. And and the point I want to emphasize is that simply wishing that things will be better under P two B is not going to work. Once these people are elected, we must create structures of accountability, constant, you know, engagement with the political system to make sure that the changes that we, we desire 
um, actually come because of our insistence on good government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Zamja. And I agree. And absolutely, it sounds like people are really taking some of those changes for not just for granted, but they're actually working on it. And this brings me to a really very important question because I think one of the statements that uh, uh, Ambassador Berry said was, you know, there seems to be this paradigmatic shift. And I like that because there's a paradigm shift. Whether it yields to the outcome that is very tangible now, it's yet to be determined. But I think one of the things when I listened a couple of days ago before President Ruto was actually um, inaugurated today was um, the court actually ruled in his favor, right? And, you know, uh, Odinga took him to court and then he, you know, they were determined that um, the court actually ruled in his favor. Now, that in itself is a paradigmatic shift considering Africa, we are in, it's not often that you hear courts, you know, rule in favor of someone who at least is not presented as an, as an establishment candidate. And I, I'm going to ask them, uh, Ambassador Berry, one of our, one of our, one of our, I think, uh, one of our audience members asked this question, and he. Uh, this is from Tijan Cole. And Tijan Cole's question is, can they talk a little bit about the importance of independent judiciaries and electoral commissions in elections in Africa? Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, um, Dr. Rogers. You know, I, uh, you can see from the background, I'm shifting places. I'm squatting in, in my friend's office and that the... Uh, but um, I think yeah, it is a very yeah. good question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, I think it is a very good question from Abdul. Um, yes, I mean, the, the independence of the judiciary is critical, but it's not the first time it has happened in Kenya. Um, Odinga had sued uh, when, when he lost to Uru, and the, the, the court ruled in his favor. Um, this time he lost, and um, what, what what is important as well is that uh, there is a transition period between the announcement of the elections and, and the inauguration of the president. And in Kenya, um, from their constitution, uh, the Supreme Court has the last word on elections, not the electoral commissioner. Um, in Sierra Leone, we had that um, terrible situation in 2007, when once the Supreme Court declares uh, invalidated um, 270 or so thousand votes that could have made a difference, uh, the president is immediately uh, inaugurated in the, into office. And the, the judiciary in that instance has absolutely no chance, I mean, in our situation. But Kenya has shown that they have a very strong uh, judiciary, and, and that's extremely important for stability uh, because people going into elections need not resort to violence. If they feel cheated, they know they can go to um, uh, the, the Supreme Court, to the judiciary, to determine whether they have been cheated. Um, and the, 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 uh, the, the verdict in that case, which I have read, is really meticulously, um, I think, uh, deliberated. Uh, it, it is a very good one. It weighed all the arguments, uh, look at most of the evidence, and 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 then pronounce that the elections were uh, won uh, legitimately. And and I think that the great service that the Supreme Court has done, the great service, I think a terminal service in terms of his political career for Odinga, uh, it has helped to embed democracy. I mean, uh, when, when I was in Nigeria to look at the elections, that was back in 2011, that, that one. I mean, there were thousands of cases still pending uh, four years after the elections. And that's not good for stability. Um, it means that people will think that once election results are announced, once even if they, they, they know, they have evidence that those elections were rigged, uh, that there is no remedy. And the remedy they will have then is to resort to violence. And, and, and that, that, that's really a very terrible uh, kind of thing. Well, um, it, it, the, I, I am not, I, I, I spoke about a paradigm shift, um, a potential paradigm shift uh, if Mr. Obi wins the election. That would be, I think, very highly significant given how uh, the, the Nigerian political situation is structured, especially for presidential elections. Um, but uh, I, I hope he does win. I am not optimistic he will win. 
because of the entrenched nature of uh, regionalism, uh, ethnicity, and uh, the powerful interests at stake. I mean, the, the, the other two candidates are extremely wealthy and they have very strong connections and they've run elections before. They still have residual support. Oh, no, not Tinubu hasn't run uh, president before, but he does uh, come from a party that has a very sophisticated machinery to, to collect votes and to rig elections. Um, so I, he may not stand a chance, but um, certainly a, a strong independent judiciary is critical to uh, the stability of our political systems. And that should be the lesson from, from Kenya. I, 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 my, with your permission, uh, my, my dear friend, mm -hmm. I, I, I will have to run. Uh, I have a meeting uh, with uh, the state, so I, uh, I'm sorry. So uh, I, I thought it would end at four. But, yeah. but, but, um, and, and thank you, panelists. Um, Professor Soko, I, I really enjoyed um, your, your presentation. Uh, Dr. Tam, the, Tam what? Tam, George. Thank you very much, George. I enjoy your perspective. Uh, we, we, we shall meet sometime. Uh, Stephen, my dear friend, I, 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 with your permission, may I, may I run? Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. I mean, you you, you actually gave me an advance when that you're going to have a meeting, and we appreciate your input, as always. And um, you were very, very, very vital for this conversation. Thank you so much. And um, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of questions for you, but um, we appreciate of your time. And then we'll let you know. I, 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 I can send answers by, by email or something. I will send a text to you. I'll oh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Berry. And thank you so okay. much for taking the time. I know you are busy, like everybody else, and... Um, Thanks because for that. I have, to, that. I have to travel back tomorrow and I have uh, it's wrong. I have some, some wrap up meetings to do. Uh, so, thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, you have okay. wonderful travels. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Okay. So thanks. And I just want to go um, to Prof. Soko. And I think I'm just maybe as a way of uh, moving on, I'm just taking up from where um, Ambassador Berry said something in terms of election violence. And this is a question that came up. Came up. I think there is something to learn about Kenya elections, but also going forward, looking at Nigerian elections, that the real poten uh, potential for violence is, is there. So Jacques Bahati is one of our is a policy analysts here. He asked this question in terms of post-election violence. Kenyans deserve recognition and praises, and I think we all can remember why. Um, what can other nations learn in Africa from Kenya, including the Nigeria election ahead of its presidential election? Um, Professor Soko, I don't, I don't know if you want to just uh, chime in yeah. on that. Yeah, I think that the key lesson is that uh, leadership and governance matter. Uh, that's, the, that's the key lesson, you know, governance, governance, governance. And I want to elaborate on that by talking about the importance of institutions. So yes. we, we talk about leadership, uh, but you know, leadership alone, and as we know from the experience of the African continent is not enough. Yes. You know, we've had a, what is called a big man syndrome, you know, people who think that they are indispensable. If they die, the nation will suffer. You know, I'm in South Africa now and my neighbor in the North is uh, Zimbabwe. You know, Robert Mugabe used to say, well, I can't, de I can't desert my people. They want me back in power. Uh, if I die, the country will suffer, which is absolute nonsense. You know, the country is doing well now. Uh, it's not doing well. It, with, it, it's not doing well, but, uh, you know, it didn't collapse uh, the way we thought it would when he left. So uh, the, the, the point is this. Uh, and and you, you asked that question about leadership and followership. You know, they go together. They go together, you know, uh, and, and it's a simple thing. It's not complicated. You know, the uh, followers will follow a leader if the leader is accountable. If he's accountable, they'll follow you. If you lead by example, they'll follow you. And you don't have to complicate it. You know, you just think about yourself as executive director in your office, uh, Dr. Rogers, the people you lead there, if you say something, you do something different, you do something else, they won't follow you, right? They probably won't tell you, but they won't follow you. You know, uh, the same applies to political leaders, business leaders everywhere. So followership and, uh, and leadership, you know, go together. And I always say to my students, you know, you folks always think that there are leaders out there. 
you know, you are here, you are students, MBA students. So you say, oh, no, there are leaders out there. What are they doing? No, no, no. It's you who are the leaders. I always say to them, you are the leaders in this continent because the majority of people on this continent don't have the time or the resources to think about leadership issues. They spend their time thinking about the next meal. Where will they get their next meal, right? They don't have time to sit like us here to think about these big issues and so on. So I say to my MPA students, PhD students, you folks must take control of this continent. Whether in the media industry or in the judiciary or whatever you are, you are a leader, you need to take control and lead, right? And lead by example. So if you are a, a leader that is accountable, that is professional, that is ethical, and uh, people will follow you. The problem with the African continent is that the leaders have betrayed people big time. They have betrayed consistently. That's why we're so skeptical. I'm very, very, very uh, optimistic about this continent, but op cautiously optimistic, always cautiously optimistic. You know, I lived through the 1980s uh, Steven, I don't know why you were, maybe you're not born or maybe you're born, <laughs> but I'll tell you, Very young. That, yeah. was a, that was a terrible period in Africa, to live in Africa, what was called the lost decade, it was yes. horrible, horrible, yes. I lived through that, Africa is far better today than it was then. It's more politically stable. Some countries are doing better than others. You know, it's a very complex picture, nuanced picture that you're talking about, right? But there've also been regressions in Mali with military coup in Chad. In, you know, we thought Ethiopia, we, the, the, the Swedish folks even gave the prime minister of Ethiopia a Nobel Peace Prize. They thought Ethiopia is doing well, but we look at, so there've been achievements, setbacks, regressions. We've got to look at a nuanced picture when you talk about Africa. But the point is, is leadership, there is no substitute for leadership. I may, uh, let me make it clear. I agree. You can have the, even the best governance structure, but if you, have, you don't have the leaders, this is where the East Asians have beaten us. In East Asia, a, a unity of purpose, national vision, execution capabilities. When I talk about leadership, the ability to implement policies, all these things. You know, we are very good at making policies. We can't implement policies. We are very good at making promises, but we lie to our electorate. So these young people, these young people who are voting and they're looking for help. Mm -hmm. They're know. looking for help. They vote Hakain. I told President Hakain Hichilema, we hosted him in Jove. I said, Mr. President, you were voted overwhelmingly by young people. Don't betray them like your, your, your predecessors did. Don't betray them. These kids are looking for an escape. They don't have an escape. You understand? They're frustrated. They're angry. They are, some of them are unemployable. Some of them are ineducable. Yes. Right? So they're looking. That, that's what leadership and followership, followership go together. The judiciary is important because we need institutions. You know, when you look at Japan, when you look at Belgium, when you look at the UK, look at how easy the change of office happens in the UK. You can have the prime minister resign this afternoon. The government doesn't collapse. No. The bureaucrats can run the show. They can run the show. Japan for many, many decades was run by bureaucrats because they couldn't, the politicians couldn't run the country. They couldn't form coalition governments, but the, the, the bureaucrats ran the show. In, in Belgium, you know, it's an interesting one because in Belgium, when they couldn't form a government for almost 12 months, actually during that time, the economy grew. Wow. <laughs> it was doing well without the politicians. Wow. We need to have this thing in Africa where you can have both leadership and governance. If Mugabe dies today, we shouldn't be thinking, oh, what will happen if Mugabe dies? No, Mugabe dies, the show goes on. If Buhari dies in Nigeria, we, why should we be worrying about, oh, things will collapse you? No, no, the show must go on. If Ramaphosa happens, to, something happens to Ramaphosa in South Africa or to Zoom or wherever, the show must go on. You must have the leadership and governance 
without all this stuff about the big man syndrome. And absolutely, absolutely, Prof. Super. And I agree with you, especially when it comes to leadership. And I think it goes back to the original question you asked when someone was asking about how do we get uh, young people. I mean, uh, how we're asking how do we create followers? And part of being followers is also having a good leadership that people can emulate from, you know. And I remember, I think, talking about, you know, going talking about young people. And this question is really for Dr. Austin Tam George, you know, picking up from where Prof. Soko just left, you know, the idea of Africa's population, 60% is young. Zero to 24, 60%. That's how the demographic looks. And the idea that somehow this is irrelevant, I think is beyond the question because you cannot ignore that number. 60%, you know, there's nowhere on the continent that has this burden of uh, young people. And yet sometimes we don't see their aspirations as organic or that meaningful or that they are incapable of making the change, you know? And, uh, you know, the idea that somehow some of them might register, but they might not vote. And I think somehow to some extent they are underestimated. And just as we are moving that to you, I remember I also met um, you know, President Hitchich, Zambian president, and um, he was actually catapulted to power by, by the young people of Zambia. My question to you, Dr. Dr. George, is that um, in, in Nigeria, with this number of population, and now there is going to be an election, of course, there is a fear of um, you know, whether there's going to be a political violence or not. Now, what kind of leadership do you think um, maybe the young people need to demonstrate in the, you know, in the event that really the outcome doesn't necessarily favor what their what you know what their outcome should be or like what they aspire for. You know, this is this is a very important question because um, you know it, it strikes at the at the heart of of sustainability. I mean, you you have a candidate whose message you know you love. You think you want to vote for him, but how do you think you, you yourself, you know, as young people, can come together to make sure um, that you, that that the candidate, you know, delivers when 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 he eventually wins? Uh, this is a very important question in, in the OB campaign because OB is the focus here in, in Nigeria. You know, in the OB campaign, we are seeing something very unique. I, I, I can't quite recollect that we've seen this kind of momentum behind a candidate since 1960. Um, we have young people, um, professionals, doctors for Peter O.B. who are holding you know, clinic rounds, who are holding free eye tests, who are holding all kinds of civic engagement events, rendering free services across the country, joined and supported in some cases by Nigerian professionals in the diaspora. We have uh, Peter, uh, lawyers for Peter O.B., most of whom are very young lawyers between between 20 and 40, you know, who are given free legal services to people who, who otherwise wouldn't give, uh, who, who would, wouldn't even give, um, um, have um, any kind of interest in the political process. We have engineers, market women, all kinds of people coming together, you know, rallying behind a candidate. Now, if this kind of, this kind of, you know, tendency continues into a Peter B presidency, what we are likely to find, um, Steve, is a very inclusive and people-driven administration. And that can only be a good thing um, in Nigeria. I am personally excited by the prospect of that kind of change happening in Nigeria because, as I said in my earlier uh, interventions, you know, Peter B is not entirely a new person. But, you know, the difference is that he has created a narrative that has resonance. You know, he has connected with everyday people. As recently as 2019, the same Peter B was, in fact, a vice presidential candidate to Atiku Abubakar, just to tell you how much of an insider he is. But it's not it's the, the insiderness. It's not so much whether you participate in the political process as much as whether you have a, a political and social vision that departs, you know, from the status quo. And that is what uh, OB has done to say, look. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not new in the political terrain. I've had my own political battles. And, you know, I have, I have my own political scars to show for this. But, you know, there is a very strong need for the country to move in a different direction. And I volunteer my vision. I volunteer my skills. I volunteer to bring people together. He has never, as far as I can, as far as I, I, I remember, been able to, uh, yeah, he has never, you know, projected himself as someone who is going to do it alone. And this is why it's exciting that there is a very massive civil, um, you know, coalition around this candidate. So far, I don't know how sustainable this is going to be. So far, uh, there is a massive coalition 
uh, around, uh, building around each of these candidacy. So if we are able to make this to culminate into a P2B administration, then I can tell you, uh, uh, you know, uh, Steve, that the outlines for change um, in Nigeria may prove to be very exciting indeed. But I want to, uh, you know, go back uh, quickly to a very interesting point, you know, that uh, Professor Soko was ma making concerning um, the role of the judiciary in um, electoral outcomes in Africa. And uh, we've seen um, as recently as last week or so that the determination as to whether William Ruto was going to be president uh, was made ultimately by Supreme Court justices in Kenya. In Nigeria, we are used um, not only to fighting you know, around the polling units, we are also used to very long and bitter litigation processes um, in Nigeria. And my contention is that I think it's a very dangerous thing for democracy when it takes only a gaggle of justices to ultimately decide uh, who has the legitimacy of the people to, uh, to govern. I think what we need to do um, across the continent is to make sure that the ball stops at the polling unit. People should be able to make the choice and the choice should be so transparent that people find no need at all to litigate. Because in the case of Nigeria, we are seeing that the battle is gradually spilling into the judiciary and um, you know it has a it has the potential to weaken the judicial system you know as a, as an as, as an impartial arbiter um, in, 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 in this kind of cases and the moment politicians are able to infiltrate the judicial system and corrupt it um, then that would be a very serious danger indeed for for democratic practice on the continent so overall i think that you know peter b has great momentum, not because of who he is, as much as the vision he has been, he has been able to narrate. Um, he's a very simple, he's a very, uh, he's a very simple guy. Um, you know, maybe because of my own uh, communication background, I tend to see his simplicity as a form of communication itself, because mm. in Nigeria, we are used to seeing um, politicians who live in massive mansions, driving long convoys of cars, uh, fly business classes and fly around in private jets. Um, so far, uh, what we have seen with Peter B is that he's led a very simple campaign. Um, he dresses very simply, you know, at the signification level. Um, dressing itself can be a message. He, there's mm. a certain, you know, simplicity about him. Um, he, he flies the economy. Um, you know, he, he, he carries his own luggage. You know, so at the level of, you know, multiple symbolism, this has really caught the attention of the people to say, look, if we can take this kind of frugality, you know, this kind of decency into governance um, and, refer, and elevate it to the point, press it into, you know, policy service and execute it, you know, this will be a model for, for Nigeria. So, you know, as I said, you know, he may, I, I don't know whether he's going to win, but I can tell you, that the mood of the people is very, very good, you know, concerning Peter Obi. And uh, the fact that we are discussing it now rather than other candidates tells you uh, quite a bit of what is going on in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. And I think I mean, you, you really unpacked a lot of things. And I like, I really love the narrative that you provided. I mean, I haven't really been following, um, you know, uh, Mr. Obi's naturally in terms of his, um, his, um, his, his campaigns and his strategies and who he is as a person. And I think that's so important because I think um, it goes back to what um, Dr. Prof. Soko said, you know, um, leadership. And leadership for him is probably how he carries on himself, carrying your own briefcase or, you know, or, you know, doing the simple things that people can see as normal for a leader, as opposed to huge entourages, living you know, luxurious lifestyles, which really doesn't, um, um, which has become like a synonymous for many African leaders. And I think that change, that change is really part of what we are, we, we are discussing here. The question has always been whether it is organic, in other words, that it translates to actual governance in terms of giving people what they want. Now, as a way of summarizing this conversation, um, I'm gonna ask um, my panelists, I know um, audience might have a few questions of sending in there. Just to summarize, um, Prof. Soko, I'll start with you. First of all, um, I just want to thank you guys so much for really making yourself available for this very tropical conversation here. But I think, I guess what I want to, ask you just in one minute, just one minute of real summarizing this, um, this idea of 
do we think change, especially on the African continent, is that going to come from? Is there anything like a dynasty, or is there really something like a, like a hustler? But these are just narratives, in other words, where they have just become iterations of what we already know, you know, which is more like a communication issue as opposed to, I mean, which is more like a framing as opposed to real governance. Or do we need something different from what we already have in terms of leadership, like people who don't represent the current status quo? Um, so I'll give Prof, 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 Prof Soko, and you can use that to just summarize your statement, maybe in um, a minute, and then I will ask Professor Tam, George, to yeah. sum up. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Rogers. I think uh, I'm really inspired by what uh, Dr. Austin, uh, you know, Tom George uh, said about the new narrative that is emerging on the African continent. We have these new leaders who are emerging. They have nothing to do with liberation movements. They've never been part of liberation movements. They are trying to, you know, to forge a new path for this continent. It's not only Peter Obi, and, and I've heard a lot about him. Um, I didn't know much about him, but I've heard a lot about him for me to follow what is, you know, how his campaign is going to unfold. But I know also about Hakaile Hichilema in, Zimba, in, a, in Zamba, who is now the president, who is now the president, and I can see what he's doing to change the narrative using the power of the presidency of incumbency. And uh, I'm, I've been amazed by how, you know, Zambians, some of whom were here in this country, uh, are, are now flocking back to their country, saying, we believe in our country, opportunities are opening up, this man is doing wonders. This is amazing. And I'm looking at Uganda, you know, Bobby Wine is also doing that. Uh, he's been repressed by uh, Museveni, but, you know, he's really, really standing up to the tyranny of the old established leadership. And I'm looking at Zimbabwe with Nelson Chamisa. He's a young man who's a lawyer who's also standing up to, uh, you know, the dilapidated government uh, without ideas and no, 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 I, you know, ideas for the future of this of this continent. So I think that's, for me, that's a big takeaway for me is that we are having a, a new a crop of leaders emerging on this continent who want to take us in a different direction. The second uh, take for me is that we, uh, we must be, not be simplistic about this continent. It's a very nuanced continent, very complex continent. There have been achievements, there have been setbacks, there have been regressions, and that is how that is how it's going to unfold, given the complexity of the continent. And the third point, my this is my final point. This for me, this is the big thing for this continent. This is a continent in transition. I repeat, right? It needs a new crop of leaders mm. that will manage the transition, the same way as the Chinese did since 1976. Since 1976. When Mao Zedong died, there was a new leadership that emerged. It decided to take China in a different direction. It did what it had to do with him over to the next generation. You know, it was Deng Xiaoping, and then they handed to um, uh, uh, Jiang, Ziba, Jiang Zibao, and Jiang Zibao handed to Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao handed to the current president, Xi Jinping, right? We need to develop layers of leadership that are going to manage the transition that we're going through on this continent, yes. demographically, politically, diplomat, on all fronts. That is where that is where our challenge for me, the substantive challenge is uh, for this continent. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rogers, for inviting us. It's been a wonderful conversation. I really, really appreciate the opportunity uh, for having been part of this conversation. And thank you. You, you are a breath of fresh air, Prof. Soko, when you have you around. And, you know, I, I, I can't thank you good enough for this. Um, so I'm going to let Dr. Prof. Dr. Tambay just, just summarize in one minute, and then I, um, yes, and I take it off from where Prof. Soko just left it. Yes, thank you, uh, Steve, again, for, for inviting us. And um, this has been a very interesting session. Um, you know, one takeaway um, as far as the P2B campaign is concerned in Nigeria is that unlike in previous ele election circles where, you know, tribalism and ethnic considerations have, have you know, fueled political campaigns. And so far, I think because of the very terrible economic situation, the worst insecurity crisis, 
and the fact that people have lost confidence in the governments, in the current gov uh, government's ability to, to bring change. And um, so far, we've seen that a lot of people are interested in the issues that matter to them on, on a day-to-day -day basis, issues about cost of living, issues about uh, getting the um, children you know, to go back to school, issues about making sure that people are brought together in a, in, in a unified government to make sure that we chart in different directions uh, for the country. So these are very important, as I said, you know, positive narratives you know, that Peter B has managed you know, to create uh, that has resonated with people. Um, and these are governance issues, you know, in the final analysis, because people are just, you know, tired of tribalism. I think the, the best argument, you know, for a merit-driven administration for B2B is that the very terrible economic condition in Nigeria has spared no one. Rich people are complaining because of insecurity. Poor people can't find jobs, you know, so every person is impacted in one way or the other. So yeah. there, is a, there is a broad agreement that this is an, uns, an unworkable, unsustainable system and that there has to be a way to find a different path. And if P2B is able to sustain this argument, make the, it make the, the campaign issue based, make sure that he, pro, he provides very clear, easily understandable narrative uh, that people can easily you know, follow, then it means that we are likely to see um, you know, change, change in, the, in, the, in the country. And you know, Nigeria is such an important country on the continent that if today Nigeria gets it right politically, if today Nigeria is able to put B2B in office and is able to turn the economy around, uh, my, 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 my expectation is that that is going to resonate across the continent and that they'll begin to see the change happening in Nigeria as a model. So, but this is, um, this is not something that is going to happen by wishful thinking. Uh, as I said, there has to be sustainability in terms of how the coalitions are formed. Uh, P2B needs to reach out you know, more and more deep in the North where um, he's less known than other parts of the country. He needs to carry, you know, the North is, 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 you know, is even more impacted economically by what is happening in Nigeria. Is more impacted. The, the security crisis is worse in the north. So if you can take this message, use people who are from the who are from the north to make sure that the me the message you know of competence of fair administration, inclusiveness, you know, and competent administration. If that if he is able to do this in the north, you know, as much as he has done in the south of the country, uh, then he's going to have a very serious, a very serious challenge that will pose to the other more conventional uh, candidates. Peter B has had an ambiguous contact with politics, but at heart, you get a sense that he's not a politician, he's a technocrat, you know, who has joined politics to try to make a difference. Um, so if he's able to do this, um, then it will be a good day, not just for Nigeria, but for the rest of Africa. Wow, wow, thank you so much. And that's a really beautiful way to summarize this very, 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 uh, very engaging conversation. And I am so looking forward, especially to these new emerging leaders. Hopefully one day we'll get a chance to have a conversation with them. And by the way, Prof Soko, when you get a chance to talk to um, Professor, to President H.H., H., please tell him he still owes me a visit. I think I, oh, I, I remember hosting him at the University of Cape Town. And he told me if he wins, he was going to come back. Now I'm no longer at UCT, but I'm looking forward to him. And I'm happy that, you know, we got young people actually who are really issue driven, having that impact. Um, let me just summarize this by saying there's a lot of good things happening on the continent. And even though Africa still continues to have its challenges, as Prof. Soko rightly said, there's so much has happened that is good on the continent. And many of these are just, you know, one step forward to actually getting better outcomes on the continent. We've seen elections in many African countries, which was not the case before. And Nigeria has stopped having coups for a long time. And that one, actually had an impact on the West African region, for instance. For a very long time, we are not having coups until much more recently. But the idea is these countries lead and yes, by symbolism, other countries are likely to follow. So that's why what happens in these countries are so important, so especially in smaller countries in Africa. So I want to just use this opportunity to thank three of you. I mean, um, Ambassador has already left, but I want to thank you, Prof. Soko, and um, you are, you know, you are an inspiration to me, and uh, we've come a long way. And I'm happy that you honored this um, invitation, and I'm looking forward to more of this conversation with you here in Washington D.C. I want to thank um, Dr. Austin Tam Tam George, 
And um, I hadn't met you before, but I'm so happy that we had you on this panel because clearly your perspectives were so great, you know, they were so detailed and breathtaking. And I really appreciate that. And we are hoping that we can get you more engaged with AFJN when you're here or virtually. I want to thank our audience and thank you so much for some of the questions you sent. And there are a few questions I didn't, I didn't send to the panelists. I'll send them by emails, but I want to thank you for staying with us. And again, always visit AFJN for more of our programs. We are here and we are non-partisan. And again, the views expressed by our panelists, as good as they are, they represent those panelists and not the views of AFJN. Thank you so much for this uh, for this wonderful conversation. And you have a very, very wonderful week ahead. Thank you and bye-bye.